Now, what did we do last week? The mind of Christ, right? Remember we looked at a mystery, an example of a mystery would be the rapture. It's not in the Old Testament, but in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4, we have Paul detailing, excuse me, the, the rapture for, for us. But what are the two mysteries that we focused on? The mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness. Two very important things that we going to be looking at again to, tonight. The mystery of iniquity is Satan, Satan uh, pointing to the Antichrist, man's wisdom coming in, coming in and contaminating God's word. The mystery of godliness is G Jesus and the word of, the word of God. We see that right the way through, the battle between the mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness, right from uh, Cain and Abel, where Cain offers vegetables instead of a blood sacrifice. He's too proud to ask his brothers. So man's wisdom changes God's word. We see it with the priest Uzzah at the time of David, putting the ark on a cart. The Philistines returned the ark to Israel on a cart. He's copying the pagans. He's supposed to do what? Carry it on his shoulder. Man's wisdom contaminating God's word. And then you go right the way to Laodicea. What's happened there? Church is contaminated with man's wisdom. They think they are wealthy and blessed. And Jesus says, you're blind. Uh, poor, blind, wretched and naked. And he says, buy of me gold tried in the fire. He's outside the church. So we continually have that, that <coughs> battle. Remember, we talked about rewards as well. Giving up our lives to serve the God has eternal rewards. And we compared our life, which is just a breath, a vapor, which is gone immediately to eternity. And our service has eternal rewards. And then remember, we talked about trials and I talked about how we need to deal with the trials. And I have a prayer here in my Bible that I use and I'll just re read it out to you. Whenever I have trials, this is the prayer I say. Dear God, I have a complete grasp of the fact that life is not fair. So please stop teaching me that lesson. Amen. <laughs> is that the prayer you say? What is the... Uh, what I was saying, we should attitude we should have. The hymn. What were the words of the hymn? That's it. Let's say it together. I'm going to say it, then you say it. Whatever my lot, he has taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Mark likes us to proclaim, and that's an important one for us to proclaim. God wants us to be even-minded. What does man tend to be in our emotions? We tend to be up and down. God wants us to be firm on his word, a firm foundation. Corrie Ten Boom. Does anyone know who Corrie Ten Boom is? She's a Dutch girl that was locked up in a Nazi prison, Gorka, prison camp because she was keeping Jews in her home. She was in barrack room with her sister and they had prayed about the fact that the guards were brutal and that they'd be protected from that. And they were. And they were pra praising God for the answer for prayer. And in prayer, the sister in the evening, the sister said, we must also pray for the uh, thank God for the fleas. And she said, why should we thank God for the fleas? And she says, because we are to thank God for everything. Mm -hmm. So they did. They, she found out at the end of the war that the reason why the gods wouldn't go into her barrack room was because the of the fleas. So God used the fleas to protect them. Mm. Sure. Okay, that's why we need to understand that God has his ways and to praise God mm -hmm. in all circumstances. What is our memory verse from last week? 
For the message of the cross is foolishness for those that are perishing. Finish it for me. But it is the power of God. And we're going to see more of the power of God to today. So let's open in prayer and we can start this day. I want you all open onto the index. and Don't turn over yet, just on the index. Thank you, Lord, for this evening. Thank you, Lord, we can gather together and study your word. And thank you especially for the good news that you have provide, provided and this opportunity to draw on it, to understand it, and the greatness of the value of the meaning that it has for us. Bless this time together in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So what do you think will be the memory verse for the gospel message? Which verse in the Bible will suit the memory verse for the gospel message? Sports events. Yeah, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That? Whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We all know that one. So this is an easy memory verse for us. Okay, let's have a look at that scripture. So what what do we what does the scripture mean when it says God gave his only son? What does that mean? The gift. How? How did he give it give us his son? What was the key of giving us his son? The meaning behind it. Abraham and Isaac, does that ring a bell? Abraham is a type of God the Father, and Isaac is a type of God the Son. Abraham was going to give his son as a sacrifice. God gave his son for sacrifice that whosoever, remember I said the evangelists always say, who's and whosoever, and that's all of us. Jesus died so that all could have eternal life. Okay. Robbie, you can stick the second one up. Which one? What, the uh, sheep. Oh, okay. Sorry. What uh, Quentin, Quentin showed us on Sunday, and it's important for us when we're looking at the go Gospels, is that, that. What, what is that picture showing? That's scriptural. Mm -hmm. What is the scriptural meaning of that? A wolf in sheep's clothing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We are looking at the gospel, the mystery of godliness. Yeah. What's the mystery of iniquity going to want to do? Contaminate yeah. God's yeah. word. And that's what Quentin was talking about on Sunday. The enemy sowing weeds into the field. Okay, so it was a very tiny fuss, and it's important for us to look at the, this and, and the gospel, not only the gospel message, that we must learn this to, to know the foundations of our faith, and that we don't get rocked by lies from the devil. So, who can define heresy for me? Who can define heresy? Knowing the truth but denying it. Mm -hmm. yes. No, not, not, not quite. Any belief that's contrary to Christian doctrine. And let's go through some of the main heresies and see how they fit to the gospel. The first heresy is a denial of the Trinity. We have Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, so they are heretics. They deny the Trinity. All right. You even have more subtle ones. There's one that's come into America called modalism, T.D. Jakes. Anyone hear of the name T.D. Jakes? Mm -hmm. He does modalism, and that means that there's one God that manif manifests in three different modes. Modalism. He appears as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. How he does that at the baptism of Jesus, I'm not sure. All three are at the baptism of Jesus. Then you have the hypostatic union. Any theologians here know what that means? Hypostatic union is Jesus' all God and 
all man, the hypostatic union, that he is both God and man. And so a heresy will be denying the, the, that. They will say he was God, but not man, or that he was man, but not God. The prosperity theology movement will say, according to Philippians 2, 6, that Jesus <coughs> left his godhood and came down as a man. And that's why they will claim that they can do equal to Jesus. They will even call themselves at times, I am. They'll use the name for Yahweh. I am, because they equate themselves with Jesus, a man using the power of the Holy Spirit. You then have the cross. <coughs> They'll deny the work of Jesus, salvation of the cross. Again, the prosperity theology say that Jesus paid for our sins in hell. That he was beaten up by demons for three days. That's heresy. Jesus suffered and died for our sins on the cross. You will have the Catholic Church saying that Mary suffered as much as Jesus, so she is equal for salvation. She's called a co-redeemer. So my believing in Mary can give me salvation. And then there's works that, that say the cross is not enough. You also have to have traditions of the church. So you can't be saved just by G believing in Jesus. You need to follow the traditions of the church. Okay, can you see how that wolf in sheep's clothing can come into our ch church and bring false doctrine and lead people astray and have people not attaining salvation because of it? But let's look at point two, the gospel message. The, the word gospel means good news. And the four gospels are written by four different witnesses of Jesus' life. Three of the Gospels are very similar. Does anyone know what they're called? They're called the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Synoptic being Greek for seeing together. Optic, seeing, sin, synonymous, seeing together. And then you had John who seems to have written last, looking at those three Gospels and thinking, I need to add to what has been written. Okay, let's read about these four Gospels. Just as the four witnesses to a car accident viewed the, from four different corners of an intersection would have four different views of the same accident, their testimonies would include both overlapping confirmations and different insights that could only be seen from the individual's point of view. The four Gospels are written from four different groups, for four different groups of people and portray Jesus from four different perspectives. Let's take a look at them. The Gospel of Matthew was written for the Jews and portrays Jesus as the Messiah. He's telling the Jews, we found the Messiah. The Messiah has come. The Gospel of Mark was written for the Romans and portrays Jesus as a servant of man meeting their deepest needs. The Gospel of Luke was written for the Greeks and portrays Jesus as the perfect divine man. Remember, the Greeks were always looking for the perfect man. So Luke is saying, let me show you the perfect man. The Gospel of John was written for all groups and portrays Jesus as the Son of God. Ezekiel 10. Ezekiel sees the throne room of heaven and he sees four angels, four cherubs in front of the throne of God. And they've got four heads. What are the heads? The man and the, um, the bull and the um, man and the bull and the lion and oh, the eagle. Well done. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay. Each one of those represents a gospel. Jesus is the line of the tribe of Judah, the Messiah. Jesus, the suffering servant, is the bullock. Jesus is the man in Luke's gospel, the perfect man. And the eagle is the son of God. So that angel is standing there representing 
the Gospels. But there is another angel there that is wheels within wheels. And I've heard all sorts of sermons about that, talking about perpetual motion and a gyroscope. If the, if the New Testament there is in front, New Covenant is in front of God, what's going to be, else is going to be there? The Old Covenant, the wheels and wheels. God does cycles. The Shabbat, the seven feasts in a year, the larger cycle of seven year Shemitah, and then the 50 year Jubilee. So you have God with two angels, one representing the new covenant, one representing the old covenant. We must look at the Bible and interpret it from a Jewish perspective, not a cultural Western perspective. The good news for man is captured in four different ways, but an overriding message is carried through them or through all of them. God loves us. We've done uh, the scripture of John 3.16 and it's confirmed in Romans 5.8. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. We must show that same love. What did we call it when we did love? What is that love? Agape. Agape love. The core of the gospel message, uh, let me just, uh, say this. Remember, just to, just to give you a thing, we talked about the cross being the doorway to wisdom. wisdom. Isn't it interesting? <coughs> the Passover is about the cross, isn't it? Mm. This course started the week after the Passover. <coughs> The cross is the doorway to wisdom, and then we start studying discipleship. Is that a coincidence? I think God has, uh, has a real plan and purpose for us. So the core of the gospel message is that God loves each one of us so much that he was willing to allow Jesus to, to die for our salvation. This great love is also seen in the fact that Jesus loves us so much that he's willing to give up his throne in heaven to become a servant and to make to uh, all mankind and then to die for those who chose to return his love. Mankind was lost to a holy God because of their sinful nature. Only a great expression of unconditional love could restore the relationship. Remember we talked about Jacob's ladder, how God longed to restore his relationship with man and that the cross is going to, well, cross did the work. It's the ladder. Jesus is God in the flesh, 2.2, Luke 1, verse 35. This is Gabriel speaking to Mary, the angel Gabriel. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called Son of God. Remember, Jesus kept on calling himself Son of Man. That is saying he's Son of God, because it points to Daniel 7, where you see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus was speaking what's called Kesha, which is linking what you're saying to a biblical scripture. Jesus said, I am. He's linking to the burning bush. In Genesis, sorry, in Exodus. Philippians 2, 6 to 8. Who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he himself, uh, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Remember I told you about prosperity theology? They twist this one, make himself nothing. They say he became just a man. That's the scripture that they pervert. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus, by becoming God in the flesh, was then able to face all the fallen mankind must endure, and he revealed his great love for us. He was born in a manger, raised in a poor family, learned a trade, and then he supported his mother, brother, and sister on Joseph's death. Jesus would have been in his late teens, early 20s, when Joseph died, estimating. So he then had to be head of the family. He had to pay the bills. He had to put food on the table. He had all those responsibilities. What was his trade? Oh, no. 
Okay. He was a builder. You don't build with trees in Israel. You build with stone. That's again our European culture interfering with the Bible. In Europe, we build with trees. In Israel, you build with stone. You go and look at the ruins there. Let me give you another example. Where, why do we write from left to right and the Jews write right, right to left? It's because the, the center of, the, of our universe, of our earth, is Jerusalem. So, and, and, and anything, uh, the one side, I go to my right from my left, the one side uh, always writes right to left, and from the other side, they're always right. I'm not sure what, you know, the, 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 what I have come across is the fact that uh, in Europe you wrote on pay, uh, p uh, parchments with ink, so you couldn't write right to left, otherwise you would smudge. smudge. So you write left to right. In uh, Middle East you wrote on stone. So you chiseled from right to left because you're right-handed the prevalence of stone and not trees. The builder is a tech is tecton. It doesn't say carpenter, it says the Greek tecton. Tecton's a builder. Architect is head builder. And so <coughs> Jesus, Jesus and Joseph were builders. If they were builders, they were stonemasons. Okay. Reading on, he experienced hunger, thirst, weariness, and great pain, yet on all the hardships he lived through, he did not sin. He remained the perfect man example to us all. His life was dedicated to the service of others. He was the perfect servant, all evidence that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. In Hebrews 4, uh, 15, it talks about that he is the perfect high priest. He has experienced all that we experience. We can go to him knowing that he understands what we're experiencing. He's the perfect high priest. Jesus was recognized as God by his disciples. Peter's able to answer Jesus' question as to who the disciples believed he really was. Matthew 16, 16, he answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That was an extremely important moment because Jesus required them to recognize that he was a son of God as well as the Messiah before he could die. <coughs> After that statement, Jesus could go to Jerusalem and die. Where was the statement made? Can anyone tell me? Matthew 16, 16. Where was Jesus and the disciples? Caesarea Philippi at the base of Mount Hermon. What was there? The gates of hell. There was a cave that the Greeks called the gateway to Hades. And Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail. Why? Because there were four pagan temples. The mystery of iniquity was present in Israel. And Jesus is making his proclamation as the mystery of godliness. The battle is there. And Jesus is saying, the plans of Satan will not prevail against the church. He said it there for a very important reason. He's underlining the fact that there's going to be continually this battle between the spirit of iniquity and the spirit of godliness. The belief of the disciples that Jesus, the Son of God, was reiterated by Thomas when he was confronted by the resurrected Jesus. On seeing Jesus for himself, the man who had been doubting the resurrection cried out, My Lord and my God. Jesus is the second person of Godhead, the first being the Father and the third being the Holy Spirit. The three together are referred to as the Trinity in Christianity. 2.3, Jesus atoned for our sins on the cross. The Bible calls Jesus the Lamb of God. And just as the parcel lamb was slaughtered so that judgment on God would pass over the nation of Israel, Jesus died on the cross for the sins of mankind. The Passover lamb is a direct pointer to Jesus. At 1500, on the eve of Passover, the high priest cut the throat of the Passover lamb so there would be time to prepare the lamb for the evening meal. 
It was also at 1500 that Jesus breathed his last and died on the cross. Jesus died at the exact same time as the Passover lamb was slaughtered on the Temple Mount by the high priest. Exact same time. This allowed time for the woman to prepare his body for burial and place it in the tomb before 6 o'clock, the start of the Passover. According to the Gregorian calendar, what day did Jesus rise from the dead? In other words, our calendar. The third day. Sunday. <laughs> Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday are your options. Sunday. Sunday. No. Why? Because we look at it from our cultural perspective. I keep on telling you, look at it from a Jewish perspective. No, for the Jews, Jews it's, it's six o'clock on Jews Saturday. The Gregorian calendar is in Saturday. For them, it's Sunday. Mm. Huh? The Jews start their day at six o'clock. So on six o'clock on Saturday, it's Sunday for them in the evening. Six o'clock in the evening, Sunday yeah. starts, the new day. So Jesus rose on the start of the new day, which was Saturday evening. Okay. Can, can I please ask, this is a question that comes to me very often, is that if Jesus what died for three days, what were the three days? Because Jesus was crucified on a, on a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Yeah, Remember the part of the uh, Shabbat, any fe feast is a Shabbat. It's a high Shabbat, a high Sabbath. So when they're saying the Sabbath is the next day, they're talking about the Passover Sabbath, not Saturday Sabbath. Okay, and that's another mistake we make as Gentiles. We interpret scripture from a Gentile perspective and not from a Jewish perspective. It's a Jewish written book. Okay, it was the prophet Isaiah who 700 years before the crucifixion of Jesus foretold the events and the purpose of the Lamb of God. Isaiah 53 verses 4 to 5. Surely he took our pains and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, <clears throat> stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. Isaiah 53, 12. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for, his trans for the transgressors. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The main goal of the life of Jesus was to take our sins on himself so that we may be restored to a relationship with God the Father. Jesus described the purpose of his life succinctly, saying, For even the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for, me, for many. Two parts to that. One, for salvation, to give his life as a ransom. Second part, to serve. And we, as disciples, are to follow the example, to give our lives to serve. Through the sacrifice, a sacrificial work of Jesus, those who accept him as their Lord and Savior become justified. This means that instead of being seen as filthy, sinful peasants that we are, we are declared righteousness and become the Most High God. No complaints about being called filthy, dirty peasants. I thought I'd hear at least one complaint. <laughs> Nothing can ever separate the believer from the love of God. The believer has been set free. We must notice justified is very important for us to know these terms. Of justified. After justification comes sanctification. Where God as a loving father, as a loving father <clears throat> molds us into the image of his son. This is a long-term process where God teaches us through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives how to live a life that is pleasing to him. All right. We we had a, a teaching uh, at Seaway on the tabernacles, and something I'd like to add to that to those that attended. The entranceway to the tabernacle, the gateway was five cubits by five cubits. Five is the number of grace in the Bible. Five commandments relate to God. Five commandments relate to 
man. Five by five. You can only go through grace. There are four pillars. What are those four pillars that are that the entrance of the gate? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You go through the ga gate. That was the gate beautiful. Remember Peter healed the beggar. He was about to go through on the Temple Mount, the gate beautiful. That was the gate of the tabernacle. And inside that gate, the church met was called Solomon's porch. He was going to meet the church there, there. But taking from there, you go through that gate, you come to what? The sacrificial altar, where we are justified. You then go on to the lava, where they are washed and are sanctified. We are continually washed through sanctification. You then go through up the doors into the temple, where you are in the presence of God, glorification. Okay, 2.4, the Lord's Supper, communion. It's of great importance that all believers continue to remember that, that the great love that God has for them. What a tremendous gift every believer receives through the death of Jesus on the cross. The atoning death of Jesus is remembered by believers through taking part in communion and all and known as the Lord's Supper by eating unleavened bread and drinking grape juice. This act commemorates Jesus' last meal with his disciples. The Apostle Paul explains it this way. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what, what I also passed unto you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he heard given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you, and do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jeremiah 31, 31 prophesies that there will be a new covenant. The old covenant is being taken over by a new covenant. The two elements of the Lord's Supper are the bread, which reminds us that <clears throat> Jesus' body was broken or given to us. The cup reminds us that Jesus' blood was shed for us. We are never to forget or take lightly Jesus' sacrifice for our sins. A warning is given by Paul about what anyone uh, who, that anyone who takes part in the communion unworthily will face. And this is extremely important. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 29. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of our Lord. We're disrespecting the sacrificial death of Jesus. Let a person examine himself. That's very key. We have to examine our, ourselves before we take of the cup and eat of the bread. Then, and so, eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. So we are required to have, try to examine ourselves. We are required to be discerning. Otherwise, we face judgment. The Lord's Supper must be seen as an act of worship and taken with the reverence that it deserves. 2.5, Jesus was raised from the dead. This is extremely important as well. Luke 24, 1-6, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the woman took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stones rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed in light stood beside them. In their, in their fright, the woman bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The resurrection of Jesus is the very heart of the Christian faith. 
All 13 sermons in the book of Acts have only one thing in common, that Jesus is alive and he is working to change people's lives. The resurrection is mentioned more than 100 times in the New Testament. And the message is clear. Jesus not only lived and died for, the sin, for our sins, but on the third day he rose again from the dead. Without the resurrection, there is no gospel, as Paul explains to the Corinthians. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're, you are still in your sins. But as many believers do, we must not stop at that at this point of logic. We can't just stop at the resurrection. What comes after the resurrection? The marriage supper. The rapture, the marriage supper, everything else afterwards. Yet people stop there. They don't go further. Jesus was the first person resurrected from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus points to the promise of his return and our resurrection. We, at the return of Jesus for the bride, will be transformed. For this perishable body must put on imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. 1 Corinthians 15, 53. The return of Jesus is our great hope, our strength in adversity. We are full with hope, and we wait for the glorious return of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus 2.13. The return of Jesus to establish his kingdom and rule and reign with us enables a believer to face the trials of this life, knowing that there is something much better yet to come. The hope is found on the resurrection of Jesus. If we don't teach this, it's like teaching the Second World War as a history teacher, but stopping at Normandy. Does that make sense? You're not going in and con conquering. You're not defeating the Antichrist, Hitler. You're not releasing the Jews. There's no re re restoration taking place. <clears throat> Remember I said last week, there is a crown of righteousness. You don't, you don't look forward to Jesus' return. They're denying you a crown of righteousness. Who's going to tell people that are going to be tribulation saints? Who's going to warn them? Who's going to identify the end times as they're occurring towards the rapture and warn people? All those things are left out when we do not study end times. We don't look forward to the rapture and what did we call that, that period? What does the Bible call it? The day of the Lord, 63 verse, six, sorry, 86 verses in the Bible speak about the day of the Lord. And they are ignored. We can't do that. The evidence of the resurrection of Jesus is exceptionally strong, such as the eyewitness testimony that Paul recalls in his first letter to the Corinthians. The number of men who saw the resurrected Jesus was around 550. The evidence we have for the resurrected Jesus is outstanding. Any court of law would recognize that Jesus rose from the dead, from the evidence presented. <clears throat> Paul recorded that over 500 men witnessed Jesus in his resurrected body at one time. 1 Corinthians 15, 3-7. Paul is no fool. He is a lawyer and he knows that he, he is recording of all official witnesses this in a letter could use, be used against him. Paul had many enemies who, if he had fabricated this count, would have used the information to persecute him. The timing of the letter, 25 years after the resurrection, was such that most of the witnesses were still alive and at that time and could be called to testify. Paul is making it clear that Jesus' resurrection is a fact which could at that time of writing of his letter be verified by a multitude of witnesses. What do we say was the key difference between Christianity and other religions in the early teaching of discipleship? What is the main difference between Christianity and other religions? Works. works. Correct. Well done. Works. <clears throat> Christianity? Is the only religion where 
you receive eternal life through faith. All other religions you have to work in some way. There are very important distinctions be between Christianity and other religions. For example, Christianity is the only religion that does not require the follower to perform works to attain salvation. The requirement to attain eternal life for Christian is faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. <clears throat> The exceptions that he died on the cross for our sins and on the third day he was raised from the dead. For it is by grace you are, have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, that no one can boast. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. Another important distinction that separates Christianity from the other religions is the resurrection. The tomb of Jesus is empty. When you go into the garden tomb and you see the tomb there, as described in Scripture, it fits all the requirements of Scripture. When you turn around to go out, there's a sign above the door. He is not here. He is risen. A lot of people stop there and cry. It's a wonderful, wonderful realization. The tomb of Jesus is empty. Mohammed's grave lies within the confines of what used to be his, his wife Aisha's house. Gautama Buddha's body was cremated in Kushingar, India, and the Ramabha stupa was built over the portion of Buddha's ashes on the spot where he was cremated. Hindus believe in reincarnation and that the cycle is only broken when an individual attains godhood. Enlightenment. Nirvana uh, is the Hindu, enlightenment is the new age. The bodies of these Hindu godmen, women cannot attain godhood. You are on the second last rung before man in Hinduism. Are cremated and none of them has ever been resurrected. <coughs> The resurrected Jesus is totally unique and is, uh, is a confirmation of death on the cross for our sins. Jesus is alive. He is present with us and in us today by his spirit. 2.6, Jesus lives in us by his spirit. Introduced by the last sentence. The gospel, gospels truly are good news. The blessings they record just keep on coming, for they also record that the Spirit of Jesus lives in us. Jesus said in John 14, 23, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home in them. When a person believes in their heart and confesses with their mouth that Jesus is their Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit makes the person spirit come alive. This is the second birth, they are born again. The expression goes, born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. <laughs> John 3, 5 to 7, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of Spirit is Spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. So the first act of the Holy Spirit is, to, is the regeneration and at conversion. When the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in the heart of the new believer, this then places the believer in union with God and into union with other believers in the body of God. Remember we talked about fellowship, one of the teachings we did? The Holy Spirit be, uh, brings life to our spirit and commences the work of sanctification, transforming us into the image of Jesus. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the next stage where the believer is empowered by the Spirit of God for service, enabling them to bear witness to the world. Acts 1, 8, that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Remember I told you in the beginning when we did last week's scripture about the power of God? That power comes within us. 
We have access to that power. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. John 15, 5, Jesus never intended the believer to fulfill the Great Commission on their own strength and ability. His warning was clear, for without me, you can do nothing. And that's an important realization that we must commit all that we do to Jesus. Remember, we talked about our morning prayer. What should we pray? We should commit the day to the Lord, that we go out, not in our own strength, but in his strength, looking for what he has for us in that day. And then anything that happens in that day, we know that it is from the Lord. And we can praise God in all circumstances. Do you see how all the teachings are coming together? Okay, practicality. Jesus paid a great price for your salvation. You are to remember the cost of your eternal life and to live a life worthy of that sacrifice. Your life is not free. It costs a great deal. Your salvation was provided as a gift through faith and not as works. What are you going to do with that gift? The Holy Spirit lives in you as a result of the resurrection of Jesus. You have God in you. His power, His glory, use it. That's a wonderful realization, isn't it? And it's something that Satan wants to crush down in us. He doesn't want us coming to a knowledge of the power of God working within us. Your great hope is the return of Jesus. You are to remember that you are part of the bride of Christ and you are to watch and pray for his return. We have a grave responsibility to watch and pray. Look at the disciples. Jesus told them three times, watch and pray. What did they do? They slept. And who arrived while they were sleeping? Judas is a type of the Antichrist, the spirit of, I'm not going on until someone says it, the spirit of, Jesus is the spirit of godliness, Antichrist is the spirit of iniquity, Judas is a type of the spirit of iniquity, coming, who is with Judas? The Pharisee gods, the false religion, the corrupt, let's say the corrupt religion of the day would be better. Antichrist comes at the head of a corrupt religion. Judas came at the head of a corrupt religion. The disciples should have been watching and praying. They were not. What happened to him? They were scattered. They didn't foresee. We are shown. We need to pay attention to that to watch and pray. And it's of great importance for you as a believer to continue to remember the great love God has for you and the tremendous gift each believer receives through the death of Jesus on the cross. You are therefore required to continue to remember the atoning death of Jesus through the act of communion. Proclamation. Else is not here, so we can say it all uh, together. Ready? I declare that I am a sinner saved by the grace of God through the work of the cross. I therefore count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus as my Lord. My goal is a deeper relationship with you, Lord Jesus, and to fulfill your plans and purposes for my life. Uh, part five, the prayer, let me read it aloud to you, and then you can take two minutes to uh, consider the prayer and then speak and pray your own version. Thank you, Father, for the good news that my Lord Jesus has paid the price for my sins and that I have been set free. Thank you that I that, that this has changed my life and I'm a new 
creation in a relationship with my Savior. I rejoice in the knowledge that I have eternal life and that my Savior is returning to claim his church, of which I am a part. Come soon, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.